Module 15 Relational Summary Lecture GEP1, Plant Politics. In a very real sense, but one that is rarely spoken about, the politics of the East and their etiologies are really the politics of plants. Plants whose reproduction or lack of reproduction and forms of reproduction and distribution are implicated in the root causes of climate change. And because of this, some of us believe that it is possible to change this politics of environmental destruction that has led to global warming by changing the way we interact with plants. Let me explain. I want to go further by riffing off of Michael Pollan's brilliant book, The Botany of Desire, and suggest that the politics of the East that led to the global politics of environmental destruction began with the politics of wheat and rice, two plants in the grass family, two weeds really, that led to the creation of entire empires. In the Middle East, it was wheat that inspired the pharaohs to build granaries and then armories and armies to defend them, and pyramids to secure their power to control the harvests. In the Far East, it was rice. Further east still, as we wrap around the spherical earth of the Americas, it was another grass grain, corn, but its ascendance begins much, much later. While corn was domesticated around the same time as its eastern relatives, around 10,000 years ago, according to a 2016 study in the, journal, in the journal Current Biology, quote, about 5,000 years ago, indigenous people in Mexico were both hunter-gatherers and farmers. They probably got most of their calories from wild plants and hunting, but at certain points in the year used foods such as maize to supplement their diets. Today we eat sweet corn, we use maize for fuel, but thousands of years ago people were utilizing it differently, end quote, said Dr. Wales, the lead researcher of the study. Now, this is because, according to the research of Dennis Pulliston from the University of Pennsylvania, civilizations like the Maya, who built their great pyramids in the rainforest, were primarily subsisting on tree cereals like the Maya bread nut, Brasum malacastrum, and depending on that for their daily bread and on agroforestry for feeding their populations and their livestock, one of our chief drawdown solutions. The contention Pulliston's research inspired was that civilization actually didn't depend on grain agriculture, and that it was in fact when the Maya began to rely more and more on corn instead of Ramon, the Maya bread nut, that their ecology changed and their politics became increasingly draconian and brutal, filled with human sacrifice and their great civilization started to collapse to the point where the arrival of the plagues of the conquistadors sealed its doom. Now, scientists have to piece this together from the archaeological and ecological evidence and often have to step outside their cultural comfort zones to see it because the Spaniards burned and destroyed all the meticulously collected records of Maya history recorded in the codices that they found claiming that any knowledge found in the Maya database if it wasn't in the Bible, then it would be from the devil and not worth knowing. And if it was in the Bible, it was already known and thus not worth preserving. But one thing seems clear. The great forest civilizations flourished for hundreds and hundreds of years. And though corn has been, had been domesticated 10,000 years prior and well used 5,000 years ago throughout the Americas, it wasn't until the 15th century that its ceremonial and secondary uses were replaced by reliance on it as a staple, and ecology being as fragile as it is, within a couple hundred years, it caused the collapse of yet another civilization. In the East, of course, the story was only too well known, if rarely understood. As I've mentioned, reliance on the weed that we call wheat turned the Middle East into a desert. The accompanying deforestation recorded in the Epic of Gilgamesh and the Old Testament led to epic and destructive flooding that caused its own extinction crises so severe that mythology had to invent a story about a conservationist who has to build an ark to preserve the DNA of everything he can get through the storm. And what about the Far East? Well, there was something clearly different about the East. For one thing, while they became absolutely addicted to rice, they handled that addiction in clever ways, few of which seemed to have involved conquering others or causing deserts. Rather than letting rice cultivation turn the land into desert, they expanded it through a clever combination of wetland creation, incorporating ducks and geese and fish into the wet rice growing mix to maintain the fertility of the land, and in dry rice hillside production, cooperating to create an incredible system of fertility-retaining terraces 
which resist flood and erosion, and which persist to this day. And as I learned in Japan when staying with a rice farming family in Tajima, white rice, the processed form devoid of nutrients, which you know from your trips to the sushi bar and from Uncle Ben, remained a ceremonial delicacy, with the bulk of people's diets still coming from the enormous variety of animals and plants that make up the traditional Asian diet. Where the Middle Easterners wrote religious tomes about our daily bread and had to warn their acolytes, but man does not live by bread alone, and prisoners were at best fed on bread and water, the Asian countries celebrated diversity in both cultivation and consumption. And that may be the key to why their politics never became as overtly conquistador as the Middle Eastern Mediterranean empires and their European descendants up north, playing back into our observation that China only used its gunpowder for ceremonial fireworks. What if that's the key to a kinder, gentler politics? Keep the things that can do the most harm ceremonial and feed your gut and your mind with staples that actually increase the common good. Forget what you learned in high school about how all civilizations eventually collapse. Look at what the history books actually say. <clears throat> For example, this excerpt from William R. Nestor's 2010 textbook, Globalization, History of the Modern World. He writes, quote, The first civilization emerged in Mesopotamia around 5000 BC, and for the next 6,500 years or so, great civilizations there and elsewhere rose, extended their rule, then collapsed for a variety of interrelated political, technological, economic, military, and ecological reasons. During the 15th century, beyond Christian Europe, advanced and powerful civilizations sprawled across vast stretches of the globe. Ming China, Aztec Mexico, Inca Peru, Benin Africa, Mughal India, Ashikaga Japan, and Ottoman Asia Minor. In Southeast Asia alone, there was a patchwork of smaller civilizations like the Khmer, Thai, Vietnamese, Burmese, and Javanese, all of these non-European civilizations were ruled by centralized bureaucracies and had achieved enormous advances in technology, the arts, philosophy, and wealth. However, despite their dazzling accomplishments, none of the non-European civilizations developed the related psychological, philosophical, and technological prerequisites for modernity and global conquest." End quote. Haven't you ever asked yourself why? You see that the European eugenicists and social Darwinists, desperate to justify the conquests, turned to several bizarre pseudoscientific ideas. The first were that humans that were actually composed of different races, by which they really tried to implicate species, aware that technically the fact that people can and do intermarry and have fertile children proves we're all the same species. But they wanted to forbid such miscegenation, intermarriage, and were desperate to prove that the other races were somehow inferior rather than simply better behaved, to explain away the uncomfortable fact that only they, the Middle Earthers from the Middle East and Europe, direct descendants of and inheritors of the cultures of the Roman Empire and the wheat growers, were hell-bent on conquering and enslaving the rest of the world. What really motivated such brutality? Well, the easy answer is money, but money is just a symbol for some kind of wealth exchange, and previous civilizations had monetary economies that didn't inevitably lead to such political conflict that wars resulted, and trade actually did more to bring cultures together than divide them. There were plenty of ways to earn money without going around committing genocide or enslaving people. In fact, these seemed to be really risky ways to build an economy or get rich. So I have my own theories, gleaned from researching classic books like Botany of Desire, and The Omnivore's Dilemma, and Second Nature by Michael Pollan or like William Dufty's Sugar Blues, and Sweetness and Power, The Place of Sugar in Modern History by the anthropologist Sidney Mintz, and Nutrition and Physical Degeneration by the anthropologist-dentist Weston Price, and of course, Against the Grain, How Agriculture Has Hijacked Civilization, that great book by Richard Manning. Go further into the past to Samuel Butler's Erewhon and consider them in light of Richard Dawkins' the selfish gene, and the extended phenotype. Take these books and watch the recent film Little Joey and put them all together and see what you get. These books and other research suggest that agriculture really did hijack civilization, 
take grains and crystallized juices from one plant family out of the 463 that humans used to consume in their omnivorous, biodiverse diet, hijack civilization. Sugarcane, wheat, rice, corn, oats, barley. Think of how much you consume from these in a day, every day, all day, every month, all year, over your entire life. All grasses, member of the same grass family, Poaceae graminae, all disturbant species that flourish after fires and floods but disappear when the forest returns. Think of all you're willing to do to get them, to grow them, to nurture and process them. Crusades to the Middle East, conquest of India, the establishment of a brutal slave trade to grow them in the Caribbean and the American South and in South America. It's like Manning claims in his book title and argument, as though this one family of plants hijacked civilization, took us over, colonized our minds, parasitized our bodies, and made us work for them. Clearing the forests and prairies, burning and raping the land to grow endless plantations of sugarcane and vast cornfields and rice paddies, and worst of all, because of the addictive gluten compounds in them, amber waves of grain, wheat from sea to shining sea. It even made it into the American anthem. Certainly, the growing of grains and other grasses has had the greatest impact on our climate. That's where all the fossil fuel machinery and fossil fuel derived fertilizers and pesticides are devoted. That's what all the soil destroying plowing is for, to create disturbance that only weedy grasses are adapted to. It is this monarch family monoculture that's responsible for 90% of industrial agriculture and its excesses. Hell, we even grow them now to feed our cattle and pigs and chickens. Animals that evolved in the forest eating shrubs and leaves and rooting for truffles and grubs. All of us, we and the animals now, are fed on grains and sugar. They're in everything. Even our gut microbiome has evolved to stay addicted to them, like the gut of a lactose-drinking infant. And if we don't get them when we want them, we throw a tantrum, just like a baby, and we get violent. The East certainly got addicted to rice, and the West got addicted to corn, and it led to big problems in their societies, but for most of their history, they stayed away from conquest. It was in the Middle East, in Middle Europe, what we consider here the ecological north, that an uncontrolled experiment with the grains of the wheat plant began 10,000 years ago, and quickly after we see the rise of conquering empires. Their diet of daily bread and sugar-infused wheat products, cakes and cookies, is now a global phenomenon, and with it, Land everywhere has been transformed to grow as much grain as possible, and climate change has resulted. I've wondered now for, for more than 40 years after visiting my first tropical rainforest and coral reef ecologies as a 17-year-old student at the Four Far Field Station on Andros Island in the Bahamas, and learning firsthand about the threats of deforestation and overfishing, what might really be driving our greed? If it was really hunger, a true hunger, a lack of vital cell-building proteins and lipids, would we see such food waste? So many rotting corpses and half-eaten and completely uneaten portions of the precious vertebrates and invertebrates that we claim we need to feed the world? Or does greed and waste come from somewhere else? A place not of true hunger, but of addiction. A few years later, as a college student, I was on a field expedition to study the ecologies of Venezuela. On that trip, we went to watch the rainforest being burned and cut down. And for what? A sugarcane plantation. I was appalled, and the experience galvanized my resolve to eliminate sugar from my diet. I'd been taught about the rainforest beef connection, but had never given a thought to the role my soda and cookie habits were having on the rainforest that I claimed to love so much. What are we going to tell our grandchildren? I thought, that, 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 that we wiped out all the unique biodiversity on this planet for things as trivial as, as Halloween candy and birthday cakes and desserts? The only hopeful part of that month-long Venezuela trip was meeting a rancher who was exploring traditional sources of meat, indigenous sources of meat, as alternatives to the non-native beef cattle. At one point, we came over a rise in the forest on a jungle trail and looked down over what seemed like a mosaic of forest and beautiful purple-hued perennial pampas grasses the deep-rooted cordidaria that we now use as ornamental plants outside the PCGS, along a winding river meandering through a glistening wetland. And we saw what seemed to be a large herd of cattle moving up the river uphill toward us like a stampede. I wondered how long they would take to reach us and if we shouldn't try to get the hell out of the way. 
And then the first of the livestock the rancher was cultivating went whizzing by me on my right and another on my left. And I suddenly realized that these cattle were not only about half my height, but weren't cattle at all. They, they were capybara, the world's largest rodents. Our host said, normally people drain the swamps and wetlands and cut down and burn the trees to raise these foreign Middle Eastern and European cattle that the Spaniards brought around the world. But our native animals evolved with our ecologies. And if we can get people to go back to eating rodents like this, and the tepesquintli, which traditional people ate, smaller rodents, there won't be any deforestation or wetland destruction at all. The same is true of eating alligators and crocodiles. Such a meat industry, done right, would encourage more natural habitat. The only real problem is one of taste. Modernist European-influenced diets don't care much for reptiles and rodents, do they? Perhaps, I thought, meatless Mondays for the climate should be turned into multi-species meats on Mondays instead. A day to celebrate eating a wider variety of life forms, certified, of course, as coming from thriving habitats. Now, both are tough sells politically, and with the huge cattle ranching culture we've built in North, Central, and South America, it's difficult to see how the capybara rancher was going to succeed. It's been 35 years since I was at that wetland forest ranch, and when I returned to Brazil, Uruguay, and Argentina recently with National Geographic, we went to see capybara and what's left of the wild, but when we went for a traditional lunch to an echo ranch studded with windmills and solar panels and efforts to create some silvopasture, what we were fed was huge slabs of, you guessed it, Argentinian beef being roasted on huge outdoor charcoal fires the way the Spaniards always did it, with lots of home-baked breads and lots and lots of waste. The meal would have made both vegetarians and biodiversity championing omnivores cringe. For the time being, drawdown solution number four plant-rich diet and eat less meat remains extremely important. It's ranked number four because many people believe that meat is the real murder, as the futuristic documentary Carnage shows in such dark humor. In this movie, it predicts a future where we look back at the agricultural production patterns and food consumption habits of the previous millennia and the 20th century in particular with shame and revulsion, likening our former selves as barbarians. Cowspiracy, Okja, Super Size Me, Food Inc., The Game Changers, Raw, Earthlings, Forks Over Knives, What the Health. All these movies do a similarly good job in forcing us to confront why we're doing what we're doing to other animals and to our ecosystem, Earth Sea, and start questioning whether it's worth it. I sympathize. I had a conversation with a young man from India one day in Indonesia when I was with my Muslim Indonesian surrogate family slaughtering a goat for one of the Eids or religious festivals. He was a vegetarian, and he was appalled by the killing. He said, you know, eating meat, is, eating meat is what makes people aggressive. The animal feels fear and anger when you take its life, and it passes it on to you when you eat meat. If we could get people to give up being carnivores, give up meat, we could not only stop climate change and save the planet, but stop warfare and violence too, he said. I replied, if that were true, then we would have to ask why the people chopping down the forests in Borneo and Sumatra and killing the native inhabitants are those growing rice and oil palm, while the hunter-gatherers like the Batak and Dayak and Penan who eat Babi Hutan or forest pig are the peaceful ones getting killed. He replied, actually, they're savages, former headhunters, violent people. Are you sure, I replied? I've read that they, like our Native American tribes and the scalps they took, were a reaction to invasion by conquerors who were seizing their land for grain agriculture, for plant agriculture. I suggested he read Who's the Savage? The Documentary History of the Mistreatment of the Native North Americans by David Rohn that I referenced in my lecture about the West. He countered with, but it was also the cowboys who were doing the killing of the Native Americans to graze cattle, so that bolsters my hypothesis. Fair enough. Scientific debate is like that. We have to weigh the evidence. I agree, I said, that the act of predation, of killing, is violent, and I pray for a time when the lion would lie with the lamb, but I don't see the evidence, I said, that eating meat per se makes people violent against other people, nor that raising animals makes people violent toward other people or other animals. I see land conversion making people violent. The Plains Indians lived off of the buffalo, the American bison, and had no problem with the cowboys also hunting bison or grazing cattle among the bison. 
But it is when, during the westward expansion, that the Europeans deliberately drove the bison extinct to cripple Native American societies, and then started fencing off the land to graze their cattle and plant their wheat, that the real conflicts began. And it was after the American chestnut tree, with its nutritionally rich seeds that sustained settlers and natives alike, started to go extinct in the early 1800s because of the ink disease the Europeans imported, that we see the wholesale extermination of the native population. Why, with all that abundant food in the plains and in the forests, would a people do that? Why didn't they just adapt to the great foods the natives ate? It seems the only two they picked up on were Thanksgiving turkeys and corn, a grain filled with starches and sugars. Now to you, this conversation must sound as absurd as it did to him. Although he was Indian, from a subcontinent in the East with one of the highest biodiversity diets in the world, like China, he'd been schooled in the West and couldn't imagine a meal without chapati and dal. Dal is made from pulses, from legumes or bean flour, but chapati is made from wheat. He began to get into a conversation about land conversion to wheat, and the only compromise he was willing to make was that we could all be vegetarians and increase the variety of plants in our diet, drawdown number four, and even he might be willing to try living without sugar and wheat and white rice if it would help the ecologies we both loved. For my part, I agreed to forego the meat. Fair enough. But at Harvard senior year, when I became the food proctor for our co-op kitchen, I tried to make the argument, the same argument, when I went to stock our pantries. I said to the carnivores and the vegans and vegetarians, if we're to live together harmoniously and do good for our planet, which is our stated intention in this co-op, I suggest the following compromise. I will stop ordering meats or any animal products. If you carnivores want them, you can go outside and get them yourselves, but not bring them into the co-op. And I will also stop ordering non-nutritional cash crops, particularly the white rice, white wheat flour, and bread products, and refined sugar and sugar products that are ruining our planet and our personal health. Can we agree? The carnivores shrugged. Hell, if I want a burger, I'll just go get it at Tommy's Burgers in Harvard Square or get sausages from Elsie's Diner. I don't have to have any home-cooked meat meals if it will keep the peace around here, said one. The others discussed it for a bit, and then they agreed. Yeah, why not? We can keep the co-op itself free from meat and animal products, they said. And then I turned to the vegans and vegetarians and said, seems you've got your wish. How about it? Can I also get you to agree to no refined processed foods, and in particular, no white flour or sugar. I'll still order the whole wheat for you and brown rice and whole grain stone ground corn, even though they're still terrible on the landscape. But we will get organic food only, just no refined stuff, no white stuff, the stuff with no nutrition in it. How about, huh? And the woman who led the vegan group and was the co-op's biggest baker, who made the holiday cookies and cakes and breads, she started yelling. How dare you? This is an outrage. We will never agree. I said diplomatically, but we can make whole wheat cookies and cakes and soy cheese pizzas. What's the problem? And we can sweeten with honey and stevia and maple syrup, natural things that, that don't destroy habitats, that, that don't kill animals. I thought the point was to be good to animals. We aren't being good to animals if we forbid meat and eggs here, but buy things that destroy entire habitats and drive animals extinct, are we? And Rebecca, the leader, burst into angry tears and said, damn you, damn you, no, 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 you're not taking away our sugar and white flour over my dead body. And she stormed out of the kitchen with a few of her indignant friends. The violence of their reaction bothered us for days. Finally, we had a calm moment and prevailed upon Rebecca and her team that we would try the experiment for the semester just to see, because she admitted that she'd been having health issues and probably should cut out processed food for a while. But it taught me a powerful lesson. Beware messing with people who've come to depend on sugar and starches and grains. They can get violent. These days, after being paleo on and off for six years, after learning I was pre-diabetic and losing my father to diabetes complications, I'm sure that sugar and wheat are addictive and that cultures that rely on these foods are really more like drug addicts than foodies. And the good thing is that if it's true that the cultivation and dependency on wheat and sugar and other grains and grasses 10,000 years ago in certain parts of the globe 
is at the root of our current ecological and climate and political crises, then it's a really simply hypothesis to test out. Well, or, or is it? I mean, well, not in my co-op, the dorm at Harvard, and, and maybe not so much here at USF, but maybe, just maybe, in the East? Why do I put my faith in the East? Well, consider this. If you wanted to run a controlled experiment to see what would happen to human behavior if we could get a sample of thousands of people to give up grains and sugar, and particularly to give up wheat products, to give up grains, not just for feeding humans, but for feeding the animals that feed humans too, which is where concentrated animal feedlot operations, those awful CAFOs come in, where would you go? Where would you make your political appeal for the end to grain agriculture as we know it? The Americas? Unthinkable. Europe, Germany, where they take such pride in their breads, England with its sugar-saturated black tea with tea time scones, France with its nationally indispensable baguettes and croissants, the Middle East with its insistence on pita and other flatbreads as the staff of life, reinforced by their Torah and Bible and Quran? Hardly possible. African countries, dominated since the conquest and colonialism by Christianity and Islam? Maybe not so easy. But the East, filled with a reverence for rich, biodiverse, plant-based diets, supplemented even at times by all manners of creepy-crawly things from insects, which I ate in the fanciest restaurants of Beijing, China, to snails and tons of seafood and seaweed, yes, maybe yes. The ecology is there. The history is there. It might not be such a hard sell politically after all. And eliminating grains and sugar from the diet would not only affect the landscape in climate-friendly, drawdown assured ways, but the health of everybody who tried it. Believe me, my family has tried it and seen the results, which in turn might have a tremendously salubrious effect on the political climate as well. Try it for yourself, and then let's talk.